All right. So I'm um, going to spend some time in Galatians this morning. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, we're going to focus in on verses 1 through 7 of chapter 5. Before we do that, can we, let's pray one more time. Lord Jesus, grateful for the privilege and opportunity to, to gather with your people. Thank you so much, God, for uh, the baptisms today that we get to celebrate and um, the journey of faith that these young ones are now started on, God. Um, it's so powerful to see, and may it stir the rest of us towards deeper faith as well. But now, Father, may you speak to us. May your word be louder than mine, and may, Father, it touch us at a very deep place. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are about 50. We're a little bit over 50 days into the new year. Um, we're well into 20, not well into, but we're moving along in the 2019, right? And I have a question for you this morning. I want to know, how's it going? How's your 2019? Good. Yeah, yeah. All right, a little bit more specific. How is your... How is your fitness resolution coming along? <laughs> Excellent, yes. <laughs> Good, some of you are doing well on that, right? So here's the deal, about 45% of us on January 1 make New Year's resolutions, about 45% of us. The vast majority of us um, make resolutions around our physical fitness and our health. Um, that is by far the most popular uh, New Year's resolution. Of that 45%, about 13% of us say we are going to become a better version of ourselves physically in this new year. That's what we say, and that's what we resolve to do, right? And that means we are going to exercise more, right? So we sign up for the gym. Do you know there's a ton of gym memberships, right, that, that get signed on in January? That's what happens, right? All the commercials at the end of December, all the commercials come on. Everybody goes and signs up. I'm good. We're going to eat better, right? No more drive throughs for us. We're going to meal prep and we're going to watch the calories. That's part of the resolution. We're going to drink more water and get more sleep and reduce our stress so that our overall fitness and well-being is better. That's kind of how that resolution goes. So I was curious. I was curious about how well we do with that, all right? How, how you know, how committed do we stay to that New Year's resolution about our personal fitness. So I went and kind of looked around a little bit and found a study that determined, that showed just about how well we do with that fitness resolution. You want to know how well we do? So, no, you don't. Well, so here it is. This, is. this is how we do. We generally make it until the third Thursday of January... <laughs> the third Thursday of January, before we abandon the New Year's resolution to become more fit. The third Thursday of January, right? That's, that's fascinating to me that we would abandon it so fast. But the truth is, life happens, right? Life happens, and then Chick-fil-A happens, right? And pizza and late at night, uh, all the other things that we just enjoy a lot happens, right? And before we know it, it's January. So, so for 2019, the third Thursday in January was, uh, was January 17th for us. So, as it, so on January 17th, we all went back to the drive through and we abandoned the gym. <laughs> we said... Yeah, moving on with life, right? <laughs> um, I found that really, really fascinating. So here's the thing. This helps us to hopefully understand a little bit more about what's happening in the book of Galatians. So Paul is the author of Galatians. Paul wrote an enormous amount of the New Testament of the Bible, that second, that back end of your Bible. He wrote a bunch of letters and he generally wrote these letters to encourage and to, um, to sometimes address issues that were going on in the communities of Christians. And that's pretty much what's going on here in the book of Galatians. Galatians is really a, a powerful, powerful book. It's kind of power-packed. It's very explosive, if you will. And so, um, so Paul's writing, 
But he's writing with a sense of incredible urgency. And I would also say he's being aggressive and he's, being, he's a little bit angry, right? He's just kind of hacked off about what's going on. Um, so this little section that we're going to carve out of Galatians comes in a context where Paul is writing to a group of churches that he had, like 18 months prior, he had gone through, he had helped establish the churches, he had preached the gospel to them, talked about the love of Jesus, they had come to faith in Jesus, right? And um, now something is going on there, and he's writing back 18 months later, he's writing back with a great sense of urgency and passion and boldness and aggressiveness and even anger because what's happening there is so, so serious. It's a very explosive, very vibrant, very powerful book of the Bible. And so this is what he says. We'll just carve out a little bit of this in the context, in that context. So it's uh, Galatians uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Let's, we'll read through the whole thing. We'll really key in on verse 6 in particular, but we're going to read some more verses around it because they help us too. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words. You know, you can kind of feel Paul saying, pay close attention to this. I need you to hear this. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Verse 3, again, I declare to every man who sets himself, who let, lets himself be circumcised, that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Verse 5, for through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which, for which we, the, sorry, for through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. Verse 6, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing, catch this, hang on to this, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race in verse 7. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? So here Paul is speaking into a situation where a group of other teachers, a group of other preachers are now coming behind the good work that he's done to talk about Jesus and to talk about the gospel, and they are throwing the people into confusion. That's what he says in another part of the book. He says, you are being thrown into confusion. A couple of other things, a couple of other ways that Paul uh, puts it here. He says um, in three, chapter 3, verse 1, he says, You foolish Galatians. Pretty strong language. Pretty strong language. You foolish Galatians. Another area, he's, in another place, he says, Who has bewitched you? And he talks about how you have been thrown into confusion by this, perverted, this perversion of the gospel. So he's highly irritated, not so much at the, at the people, at the new believers, but at these new teachers. And there's one thing that Paul understands that really throws up the red flags for him. He understands that believing, believing drives behavior. And what he's hearing is, what he's hearing and what, what really raises the, the red flags for him is that he's hearing that people are starting to believe this other version of the gospel, which is no gospel at all, that distorts the beauty and the profound nature of God's love. What he's starting to hear is people are starting to believe this and he, under, he knows that's going to shape the way that they relate to the God of the universe and how they relate to one another. And it is driving him crazy. That everything he came along to do and the beauty with which he, he communicated the gospel of Jesus and the love of Jesus is totally being wrecked. He's saying that could lead to disaster because people will start doing weird things, acting all kinds of strange ways towards God, and they'll start doing weird, ugly, mean things towards one another. And we can't have that. So he writes with this, this boldness and this, and this, this passion 
because he wants to bring clarity around something deeply, deeply profound. And that is the love of God. That's the love of God. He says, there should be no confusion whatsoever around this love of God. So let me land there for just a moment, right? Because not only was it a problem in Paul's day, not only was it a problem for the Galatians and other early Christians, but being thoroughly convinced and believing the message of the gospel as it communicates the love of Jesus is still an issue. In other words, I don't, full, I don't believe that we fully grasp the beauty and the power and the nature of the profound love that God has for you and me. Okay, and I know, I know. People are like, well, is he, is he just saying that Jesus loves us? Yeah. <laughs> right. And I get it. It's become, it's almost become sort of cliche in church, right? You come to church expecting to hear the preachers say that, that God loves us. And it's almost become too familiar. And some of you are thinking, well, he just had, didn't have anything else to put in the sermon at this point, so you just go to love, right? Just talk about love. It's like some of you went to church school, right? I went to a Christian school about sixth grade on up, and, and we had to take Bible class. We had to do Bible tests, right? And if you were, you know, if you were a kid that was kind of tuned in to what was going on, you knew that if you took a Bible test that you really didn't study for and it was fill in the blank or it was like multiple choice, if you just put like love or Jesus or the Bible, you would probably get it right, right? He's like, I'm just going to stick Jesus in there. I'm going to stick love in there, and it'll be good. And in some ways, I think that we've become all so accustomed to hearing that we are loved by God that in some ways it's perhaps lost its, its power and its meaning. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you just wonder if we hear it well enough. And, I, and what I don't want there to be is any confusion over that. Here, because here's the thing. If we believed it at a deep core level, it would impact the way that we relate to God. And most significantly, it would, re, it would impact the way that we relate to the people around us, Right? See, I don't think there's anything better that can be said every week in church than the fact that God deeply loves you and me. Because it is from that foundation, it's from that base that our love towards God and the way we live towards God and our love for others and the way we live towards others is established. You cannot love others well. You cannot claim to love God if, in fact, you don't love others well. And so something may be off with your belief about how well you are loved by God. Because if you operate under the assumption that God brings you in, brings you to belief, and then he says, now you got to hop through all these little, you got to jump through a bunch of hoops to remain loved by me then we are deeply confused about God's love. There was no grand cosmic bait and switch with God. It, regardless of what you might hear in church sometimes or even read in books or the culture, the, sub, the religious subculture in which you operate from, regardless of what they might communicate to you, there is none of this type of thing where God says, I got you, you're mine, and now I want you to do these things and you better do them right or you will somehow fall out of my love. No, that is not how this deal works. Paul writes in another book, he says, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And that, my friends, is what should shape how we live and how we relate to God, but most significantly, how we relate to those around us. And what is irritating Paul to no end is the fact that there are people teaching that these new Gentile believers in particular are now obligated to jump through some hoops, the hoop of circumcision, 
to be more specific. They're saying, hey, if, you're really, if you really want to be accepted by God, if you really want to be in the Jesus following club, there are requirements. I know, I know, we told you up here is all freedom and love and gospel and Jesus loves you. But you didn't read the small print. The small print says da 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 The law says da 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 You are obligated, and here it is, fellas. Step up and do what you are supposed to do. And Paul rejects it outright. He says that is not, that is, he is just, he's just, just seething because it undermines the message that he preached and most significantly it distorts this image of God's love that he attempted to share with the people. Great confusion. So further on in this section, so Galatians, again, we're in Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Um, there are about three kind of major themes that emerge if you look at these passages in particular. And um, that first of the, the, first of the themes is, is pretty significant. Um, and he simply talks about faith. He talks about faith. Um, and faith... Um, a better, a good synonym for faith is trust, is trust. So essentially, essentially what Paul is saying is that you are accepted, you are made good with God by faith. In another place, Paul would say this, by the deeds of the law shall no man be justified. And the big theological word justified simply means to be made right with God or to be in good standing with God. And so throughout Paul, all of Paul's writings, all he's coming back to is he's saying, look, there is no hoop you can jump through. There's no law you can follow to make you right with God. The only way that you are right with God is because of the love of God because of the love that he demonstrates towards you and because of what his son did on your behalf. That is how you were made right. And if, in fact, you believe that to, if you believe that, you, you are a Christ follower. If we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts, right, that Jesus Christ is, is the, the, the Christ, the Son of the living God, then we are, we are in. We are in. Yay. No one gets excited about that, <laughs> right? Because here's the deal. Again, we, we are not unlike a lot of the Galatians, right? You come across people like this that live with a little bit of doubt. You may be one of them. Always kind of in the back of your mind, and you walk out of church and go, man, that was great, and, and the worship was amazing. We're going to worship like that in heaven. It's going to be incredible. We're going to bow at the feet of Jesus. And then you end that little what you're saying with this. You say, and if I get there, right? And if I get there, if I get in. And what I'm saying is, man, now oh, you're in. You confess and believe in your heart. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Guess what? You are in. He, you, you are his and he is yours. And he sees you as his precious child. And he deeply and profoundly loves you. And if you can believe that at the core of your being, it will shape the way that you live. You will live with an enormous sense of freedom and joy. And you will not feel the obligation, whether it's put on, you for, put on you by somebody from the outside or somehow weird way it's put on you by yourself. You will not be burdened by the obligation to do anything to win God's love. That's why Paul says in the very first verse we looked at, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Stand firm. But he's talking about faith. We trust in Jesus and trust in who he is and what he has done. It's, it allows us to live in a very, very 
powerful way. But here's the thing. Here's the promise of faith. Here's the promise of trust. And that is the Spirit of God, right? Because later on in the book of Galatians, Paul talks about the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. So, yeah, there is this, this call to live and to live well and to live appropriately. Uh, when I, I pastored for a number of years in Salt Lake City, and um, I would preach the same message about how we're in and Jesus saves and we believe if we confess and we're in and we're in. And I would preach that about grace and go on and on and on. And I would always have, there's always one person in the church, that, but what about obedience, pastor? What about obedience? People got to be obedient. And I'm like, yes, they have to be obedient. You are absolutely correct. But their obedience isn't something that they sort of vigorously work themselves up to. It's not a checklist that they mark off. Their obedience is driven by the Spirit of God out of a love for that same God, right? It cannot be motivated by anything else. It's not motivated by, by the fact that somehow I think I can earn more love. It's not motivated by this, this need to impress God because God is not impressed with us. It must be motivated out of a deep and abiding love for God that is demonstrated in how I love others, right? So we trust and we believe. And the, the ROI for that trust and believe, the return on our investment of our faith and trust in God is the gift of the Spirit of God that allows us to live in accordance with everything that he calls us to, and he pretty much boiled it down to one thing. That is love. He said, love. Love. That's the first big mega theme. The second big mega theme I got to keep rolling here is this idea of freedom. Freedom. But Pastor Bernie, if you give people, if you, if you tell people it's only by, it's by grace and love and they're loved and it's all about the love and the relationship, you tell them that, if you tell them that, that will be demotivating and they will not do what they're supposed to do. And you know how people are because they give up on January 17th, the third Thursday. <laughs> you can't trust them. They got to have rules to follow. You can't give them that kind of freedom. And yet the Bible says, no, you have enormous freedom. You are free to live. You are free to do whatever you want to do. The bigger standard for you is love. So here, if we, go to, if we go to this passage, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13, listen to this. Galatians 5, 13, listen to the standard that God calls us to. It's not a list of rules that he points out. He just says, this is the way you should do it. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, right? We established that. Love, grace, called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Yeah, there it is. The Bible sort of puts this out there as the law of Christ. There's one supreme law, the law of Christ. If you're going to live in freedom, if you're going to live in the freedom that God gives you, understanding his love for you, you must understand that that freedom is driven by and is, is sort of um, is, is boundaried by, if you will, that you do everything in love. Here's the thing. So, um, I love people who love my children, right? Do you? Do you love people who love your children, treat your children nice? So, I have a couple of kids that work at Tijuana Flats. So, if you go there and you tip them well, I love you. I really do. I love you, right? Joking. But you should tip them well. Anyway, so, but, but, but I love people who love my children well. The same principle applies as for our Heavenly Father. He loves 
those who love his children well. So this freedom that we receive isn't about us to go run off and do whatever we want to do, sort of chasing the flesh, if you will, indulging the flesh, as he says here. This freedom is to love others well in honor of the God who loves us so well, in honor of the children that he died for, right? So the freedom isn't to indulge the flesh. The freedom isn't to run all over the place and do whatever you want to do. The freedom is to make sure that you operate in love. Um, So this year, this is 2019, Christina and I will celebrate 25 years of being married. Thank you. A little excitement. There we go. There we go. It's all good. It's all good. You don't have to. All right. So, so it hasn't been that, it hasn't been, um, you know, it's, it's not that we have this, this, everybody gets a marriage license, right? When you get married, that's, the, you know, it lets you get married and, and that's kind of, and then it's kind of law, kind of, you know, you have to do this now and, and, it, but you know, I couldn't find that little piece of paper if, if I needed to produce it right now. I have no idea where it is. Um, and, and I wear a wedding band, right? I wear a wedding band, and that kind of says that I'm taken, right? That's what it should say to most people, right? But it's not those sort of rules, those boundaries that compel me to remain faithful. It's got to be something much deeper than that, Right? It's got to be more than that because there's a lot of freedom, right? So the way that you remain faithful and the way that you love is to understand that the most compelling thing, the most motivating thing about you is that you must love the Father's children. He calls you to love them and to love them well. If in fact you say that you love God but you do not love his children well, you are a liar. So we remain faithful not because we're obligated by law or rules. We remain faithful because there's a higher law, a higher rule that calls us to love. And it doesn't necessarily need to be spelled out. It just needs to be It needs to be clear. That's an important word too, clarity. Um, The Bible says that um, Christ came and he came to be, he said, he said, think not that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy the law. I I came to fulfill. And so it wasn't that the law was incorrect. It was just incomplete. There wasn't the clarity around it until Jesus came. And Jesus came and he fulfilled it. He embodied what it means, right, to live that life. And then he did it. He fulfilled it. And then he walked away from that. He said, now what I want you to do because I've I've done everything that needs to be done. I just need you to go and love well. The same way that I demonstrated to you, the same way that I provided clarity for you about what the law is about, now I want you to go out and do that. And you have a lot of freedom to love. You can go crazy loving people, right? Faith and trust, one big mega theme. The second one is this idea of freedom. But don't just, don't take your freedom and use it for yourself. Use it for love. The third thing is this, and we'll land the plane here. Love. Love. It's my favorite passage in the whole section. I told you this, this is kind of where our focus is. Galatians 5 and verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The only thing that counts is trust expressing itself through love. You and I live with a high level of faith and confidence and trust in Jesus and all that he's done. You live with a high level of confidence and and trust and faith and the love that he has for me. I don't have to, I don't I don't have to spend my time trying to earn or jump through any hoops for Jesus. He says, I am good with him. He says I am good. So he said, so you know what he says? The majority of the New Testament, 
The majority of the Gospels in what Jesus sort of, his, his, grand, his grand mission and theme is to say, now go and love the people that I love. That's what he says. <laughs> he says, don't get hung up on jumping through a whole bunch of hoops for me. I'm not impressed with you. You want to impress me? Go love them. And go love them well, from your soul. And it may demand that you have to tell some people the truth out of love. And it may demand that you have, an, have to have an enormous amount of patience with people. It may demand that you, have to be, that you have to be pushed to your very limits. And guess what? You can do it because I'm going to plant my spirit within you. You're right. It is impossible for us to, ex- to do the love that Scripture calls us for. It's impossible, except for the fact that the Spirit of God dwells in us. And it compels us and it leads us. If we surrender, that's why it says humbly. That's why it says humbly in there. The verse I just read a little while ago, it says humbly. If I'm, if I'm submitted to and humbly led by the Spirit of God, It's not easy, but I will move in that direction. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. I was interested in that word expressing, expressing, faith expressing itself through love. If you go behind it a little bit to the Greek, the original language, it's energeo, energeo, energeo. It's it's where we get the word energy from. Energy, faith energizing itself through love. Faith expressing itself through love. The word means this, to be operative, to be at work, to put forth power. Ah, so what's that saying? I mean, doesn't take a theologian to interpret that. It just says... The only thing that counts is how you are activated, how you are moved towards, how you work towards loving others. How you live, how you love, how you express, how you you use your energy, how you expend yourself, not in foolish hoops you jumping through to try to impress somebody else or to impress God but quite simply in the way that you move towards others, you express your love for the God of the universe. Um, So the last about, oh, seven, eight years, somewhere in there, I've become a runner. Um, I did not start out wanting to be a runner, um, but just in this, I was, I needed something to do to maintain fitness, right? This wasn't a New Year's resolution. (laughs) But it was, it was a reality check, and I needed, the, I needed to exercise and do something. So I've run, I've run, I started out really bad. I could hardly, I couldn't run very far at all. Like, I could run for a minute, and that was it. But, um, but I could do, I've done 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons, full marathons, right? And this year, I'm going to run, uh, again, Lord willing, I will run the Chicago Marathon and the New York City Marathon later this year. Um, and I'm, yeah, it's going to be crazy, but it's all right. I'm going to do it. Um, so I've kind of gotten into running and I've gotten into uh, understanding, you know, kind of the, 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 the elite athletes and so forth. So the running community went really absolutely crazy when a guy by the name of Elliot uh, Kipchoge, Elliot Kipchoge, a Kenyan runner, ran the Beirut Marathon, not the Beirut, the Berlin, I'm sorry, the Berlin Marathon. Get this, he ran the Berlin Marathon in 20, he ran 26.2 miles in two hours, one minute, and 39 seconds. Wow, that is moving. Do you want to know how long it takes me to run the marathon? Not even close, right? Not even close to that. So he ran, um, this, is his av- this was his pace for two hours and one minute. Four minutes and 38 seconds per mile. Four minutes, 38 seconds per mile. That is unbelievable, right? I mean, that is just moving. 
He broke the world record, and he becomes the, the sole uh, world record holder for the 26.2 for, for the full marathon. And before this, before this, the running community could not even begin to imagine that anyone could come close to a sub two-hour marathon. And he didn't quite get there. He was, he was short a little bit. But the fact that he got that close now has people, believe, has people believing that, hey, hey, it's possible for somebody to run a sub two-hour marathon. That is just crazy. Here's the thing for you and me. So we understand God's calling for us to love. All of our energy, the only thing that counts is faith expressing. The only thing that counts is the energy that we expend, the activity that we do in the faith that we have in the God of the universe in love. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. The, the, the freedom we've been given The love that's been demonstrated towards us has been given to us to set us free so that everything that we do, all the energy that we have, all the activity, all the doing, all the going to and fro is so that we can live and love towards those people around us. And in doing so, in doing so, we express our greatest love for the God who saved us. So here we are, Christians, whether you are a runner or not, whether you are a runner or not, what you should attempt to do every single day, every single day is you should be trying to break a world record in loving the people around you. You should just go all out. You should be Elliot Kipchoge. In the community where you are, you should be Elliot Kipchoge in the, in the place where you work, in the, in the school that you go to, in the community where you live. People should go, look at that dude and the energy that he has and the, the activities that he do to love others. That's what we're called to do, and we should break records doing it. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you for this call to love. Thank you that you have not required anything of us but to trust you and to place our faith completely in you. And then you set us free. You set us free to love and to bring your name, honor, and glory, God, not by these silly things that we get caught up doing, but the way that we love the people around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.